Welcome to the Future of Eastern Europe and Eco-Democracy, a four-part podcast special produced by the Green European Foundation with the support of the Green Institute of Greece and the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation. The podcast features extracts from interviews of delegates to the Future of Eastern Europe conference, which took place on the 6th and 7th of June in Riga. The conference brought together young green activists from different parts of Eastern Europe to talk about the future of the region, as well as the challenges and opportunities for an ecological and progressive turnaround. In this episode, we hear extracts from the Eco-Democracy Workshop that took place at the conference, facilitated by Anna Maniadi and Dimitris Papayoriou from the Green Institute of Greece, as well as some thoughts on eco-democracy from Dimitris. We also hear from Anastasia Dorofeva from the Belarusian Greens, Gyukce Gamla from Green Thought Association in Turkey, and Georgi Tskelaje from CDN Corporation and Development Network Eastern Europe. The episode focuses on the relationship between ecology and democracy and how we can make our governance systems more ecological and truly inclusive, as well as presenting a green vision of the ideal political landscape in Eastern Europe. So, to smoothly start our session, we're going to have a small exercise, like an energizer. Anna will explain what I'm talking about. Good morning from me as well. So we're going to start with a meditative exercise. We're going to get stand up and we're going to close our eyes. I want you to imagine that you are a wild animal or a domestic animal or a flower or a tree, whatever you want from nature. Choose your favorite one. Yes. And now try to become it. Try to, to know how it feels, what it might want, what it doesn't want. Like give it your thought, give it your attention for one minute. Think that you are, it's inside you, that you're guiding it and it's guiding you. And for the next one and a half hours that our workshop will last, you don't just represent yourself here, but you represent yourself and this being, this non-human being. How does the ideal political scene in Eastern Europe look like for you? And which steps are needed to reach that that ideal state, according to your opinion? Okay, for me, if to dream, ideal state uh, would look like we have uh, all a strong uh, green uh, political movement uh, among whole Eastern Europe. We are represented on uh, different political levels, on local levels, uh, and we have strong uh, connect uh, on local levels, on national levels, and we have a strong uh, regional connection, which is connected to uh, all uh, European and the world green movement, like ideally. And uh, in in this ideal picture, of course, Greens have uh, representation, uh, like strong political representation in uh, all uh, national levels and can influence in their own countries. But as well, we have some synchronized uh, policy towards the region generally, which we could discuss together, which we could, where we can share our ideas, experiences, and when we can share resources as well, uh, like building it uh, all together like to prevent all these things which are happen- still happening in the region, like wars, dictatorships and so on. We could say that this conference <laughs> is an example of what you're describing, right? Yeah, I hope it's one of the first steps. So it would be, like for me, it would be ideal result of this conference would be we would do ma- maybe some small but uh, concrete step uh, towards this. The fundamental question for today is going to be how do we make democracy more ecological? Like. How can we put more ecology into our democracies, into these governance systems that are now running in our countries? 
Which measures can be implemented according to your opinion in order to encourage prosumerism instead of consumerism? I think that with the current system we have, it's very capitalist and very consumerist and very patriotic because the current system uh, requires uh, someone to work as long as they are not sleeping, someone to take care of the home, take care of the children and take care of the meals of that person. And the other times they're just sleeping or uh, having their Uh, basic needs. So I feel like if you tackle the current system in a way that people to think about how do they how uh, they consume and how they are currently producing things and how do they maybe affect the environment right now. And if they had time to do it, uh, that would be better for environment and they would be uh, more proactive instead of leading themselves to whatever the society is leading them. I would like to ask you what animal would you be in the exercise that you put to us? Hmm. Well, I really enjoy traveling around the world. So I would choose to be a member of the avifauna species. So maybe I would choose to be an eagle. Okay. <laughs> Interesting choice. <laughs> a migrating eagle. So I can live in yeah. two places. Amazing. To start with, I would like to ask you whether you think that the existing democratic governments can effectively solve the most pressing environmental problems of our time. Well, several scientists question the capacity of current democratic systems to address environmental challenges. And in my opinion, current democratic governance systems lack firstly the determination and secondly the tools to effectively address more or less critical environmental issues. And such kind of problems cannot always be fixed with application of technical and easy to go short term solutions, like in other areas or contexts. We know that the function of natural ecosystems is not simple and in most cases not enough studied. And when long existed equilibriums break down in the nature, it's not easy to revive them or replace them with technical approaches. Because as far as we know, current systems are trying to solve environmental issues with technical solutions. And another drawback, in my opinion, of current democratic governments is the inability to act on time. For example, decision making. One of the main issues of democratic decision making and implementation is that it takes a lot of time, sometimes too much. A simple change can take years to be voted, consulted, decided and implemented. And we don't have enough time left to save this world. That's most sadly true. Now the billion dollar question of this podcast, what is eco-democracy? If you could give us a brief framework of that very wide term. Well, the term of eco-democracy, as far as I know, is still under determination. I mean, its definition is still not precisely chosen. But when we talk about eco-democracy, we refer to a democratic system of governance that is inclusive and offers fair representation of all involved beings and not just the human being. So according to Jan Lundberg, who was one of the first people to approach the term, eco-democracy is the restructuring of our society for maximum conservation and equal rights for all species. And it basically transfers the weight from the current anthropocentric to a more ecocentric worldview. So the idea or the hypothesis is that by putting more ecology into democracy, it will help all the uh, represented species, but will also help democracy itself to function better. You briefly touched on it already, but what entities should be represented in this new way of democracy and under which conditions? When we talk about entities that should be represented, well, such entities could be animal species or trees or whole forests or, I don't know, even soil microorganisms. It might sound extreme to some, 
but we really have no idea how much favorable for the humankind are the functions that these microorganisms run. One of the reasons we actually have food in this planet is because of them. And it could be even, I don't know, rivers or the mother earth as a whole or other types of entities, whatever. And regarding the conditions under which they should be represented, I would say that it, this is still to be determined. We already have very good examples of more ecological governance systems around the world with rivers that have acquired a state of personhood, or we also have the rights of nature principles that are being incorporated into a country's governance. So I think there is optimism in this direction. And yeah, if future generations are not represented or at least taken into account, then we cannot consider our governance systems inclusive. And I don't know, in my opinion, if we don't include future generations, we are just a group of selfish, greedy individuals that <laughs> only take care of ourselves and we don't care about anything else and anyone else. In her book, The Democracy of Species, the acclaimed biologist and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer offers a compelling vision for a profound reassessment of our relationship with our non-human relatives, based on the traditional ecological knowledge and wisdom of indigenous science and philosophy. At its core is the recognition of all species and places as living persons, not as inferior beings or inanimate objects. This notion is also at the heart of the movement advocating for legal rights for nature and making ecocide a crime, both of which have been gaining traction and momentum. But reassessing our position as a species should also have consequences on the way we govern ourselves. In democratic systems, how could we begin to include our non-human relatives in decision-making? What does it mean to represent not only ourselves, but also to attempt to represent others, like rivers, mountains, eagles, or microorganisms in the soil? And could such an expansion of representation lead to a truly ecological form of democracy? How does the ideal political scene in Eastern mm -hmm. Europe look like to you? And which steps do you think that they are needed to mm -hmm. be reached for that ideal mm -hmm. state? I think the first of all, the most important thing is to have a plural democratic and plural party democracy in Eastern Europe, because the biggest challenge that we are facing is the dominance of either one party dominance or two party dominance, which is making politics very, very corrupt and makes people not trust it because you either have to choose one of the camps and this camp politics i think doesn't have place in 20 21st century this is this is very much the past and i think it will be important to to see the breakaway from this camp politics and and also the biggest problem alongside with this is that it is a lot around the personalities it is a camps but it is not ideological camps like you would see you know social democrats or or the conservatives or the liberals or whatever it is more like a personality camps you know very much centered around the few people and few influential people and in the groups and it's like a in many cases it's like a cult and that is a very big problem and it leaves and it doesn't leave the space for the policy discussions which decide the politics so well, ideal political landscape does look like more plural, which goes beyond the two dominant party systems. But of course, I mean, I'm green, so I would love to see more greens in a position of power, but also in a position of strong opposition. Because when you have the greens in your position, it makes others do green stuff as well, because then... The topics that Greens are advocating for, be that environmental protection or, or human rights or demo participatory democracy or human or queer rights or the feminism, all this and a progressive social rights, all these things are something that really 
people are into it. And we've seen in the polls recently that these are the things that are getting more and more and more popular. So when the Greens are there who are advocating for all of this, it becomes it makes other political players also, in order not to lose voters or not to lose support, they have to adjust their coordinates of the political positioning to what the Greens are doing. So the Greens, even in the opposition, can shape the political discussion. So I would say the yes, political landscape, the perfect political landscape is plural, where we have uh, political parties representing the ideas and the policies they want to achieve. And they are working in a democratic way as a party itself. And it's with a very, and it's with strong green political entity in the political landscape, in opposition or in power. Let's move on to the next chapter. Okay. Uh, all of your ideas were amazing, but we, don't you think that we have to do this in a non-violent way? So, as persons, as pacifists, we have to do it in a more democratic way, and we have to achieve this in a non-violent way. So, how are we going to do that? We cannot say, oh, it's okay, we're going to just change the democracy or something like that, but we... What is going to happen if we don't act democratically? Like if we impose these ideas of earth democracy, eco democracy. Like, do you think it's a fair way to just force the change, like more autocratic way, because we think it's right? Even if it's, it was right, uh, that force can be used in later. Uh, people who are not thinking uh, in eco democratic way, or people who are not thinking in thinking about like every phase, every multidimensional way. And that can be used for hurting nature and hurting people in the later uh, times. So. Yeah, that's true. Someone um, else want to add something on that? I mean, if in this case we are advocating for co democracy, which is based on democratic values, and we exactly. cannot act within the framework of democracy, then I think it's pointless because the action and the goal contradict, you know? Exactly. So. Uh, Dina, you wanted to, uh, yeah. to say something? I wanted to ask whether as violent you also mean punishment. Some sort of legal punishment, I think, should exist. Like, what? punish ecocide, make it an international crime. Because uh, democracy is not always, uh, it's not only right, you also have to do some things, you have some obligations. Yes. So it's good to keep that uh, duality, I think. Okay, but by... Punishment? Do you include like death sentence? No, legal <laughs> sanctions. Okay. Right. Or fiscal sanctions for the big enterprises. Physical no, sanctions? Fiscal. Uh, for the like, yes. Fiscal. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So we think that in this workshop we made the first step. Uh, but what is the next step? Through a non-violent, do you have any proposals that you can share with us? Like non-violent solutions. I mean, Aretina already suggested something, like use the power of law, like the punishment. <laughs> you wanted to say something? Yeah? You can raise awareness using publications, social media, mm -hmm. traditional media, etc. If you see like this democracy thing is not working, and, uh, you can out, I don't know, some stuff publicly. So, I don't know, just give, giving a very specific example. If, uh, I don't know, if it's a reserved area and if people don't have the rights to go and, I don't know, chop the trees or extinct or, like, you know, try to destroy the ecosystem of the place, I don't know, you can take some drone pictures before or after and try to out the things, and especially in the countries where the, these regulations are not working perfectly and are very corrupted. Another thing, I don't know, some peaceful demonstrations as well. I mean, especially, I don't know, blocking the roads. I don't know if it's how it's not violent, I don't know. Things can get violent there as well. But I don't know, public campaigns or... I also don't fully understand what, how in a violent way we can want some democracy to have more resilient ecosystem because I feel like right now we're at a point where ecosystem is 
not wasted, but like deteriorated in a way that bringing it back and waiting for it, all these processes to go on and on, we will not have enough time for that. I feel like that's why we need to take like more bold actions and radical actions. And I mean, yeah, violence, I don't even see how we can use violence in that. But like in our context, like I'm coming from Azerbaijan and when it comes to environment and ecology, all this process is not regulated at all. And there is one ministry that is ecology and natural resources. It's like a whole ministry is like a joke. <coughs> and, uh, and whenever you approach them, you never get an adequate answer and uh, it's not functioning at all. And I mean, it's very highly corrupted as well. Literally, if you have money, you can just do anything to the ecology and the built environment and to the environment as well. Why do you think non-human actors of nature that could be potentially affected by ecological risks should have a say in the generation of the policies generating such risks? To me, it's something even more important than their representation when it comes to a potential ecological risk. First of all, when we talk about ecology, we think of ecosystems and their inhabitants the living entities that exist in an ecosystem. So in any given ecosystem or biotope, we won't find only a single species. There is always diversity, there is complexity, and there are always symbiotic relations. So if we consider a democratic system of governance, something that is inclusive and offers fair representation of all involved beings, then how can it work for the good of all of them, no matter if it's about coming uh, risks or not, with only one species, the humankind being the only one representative. So of course, non-human beings should have a say in the generation of policies when their habitats are potentially being under pressure, simply because they should have the right to protect themselves, right? You've been listening to part three of The Future of Eastern Europe and Eco-Democracy, a four-part podcast special made possible by the Green European Foundation and the Green Institute of Greece.